Hello, Warriors. Hi, Kevin. How are you? Patrick. Ziggy, I went to my mailbox, and uh, I'm not sure how to use that three-in-one oil, as you can tell. Abdul, Euro Kiwi, please, right away. Are you down on the trade? Just relax. It ain't nothing but a drawdown. Okay. I, how could I tell? All right. So I have a few thoughts before I flip it over to Blake and the rest of the team. Everyone ready? Okay. So after that week, NFP dollar rebounded. We talked about it here. It held where it had to hold. To me, it still looks constructive. Uh, I'm looking for about 95.50 to be taken out. And then after that, I think the dollar enters somewhat of a mm, danger zone. After that, I'll be looking to, uh, for reasons to short the dollar. So this is what, our one hour here? Yeah. So here's the four. New highs may or may not be confirmed. Still pretty good momentum. So maybe I have to go to the daily to have a reason why. So the 200 moving's up here at 660. I'm not sure if we're going to get there. 9550 is kind of uh, after that. I'm going to be looking for reasons to short the dollar. Everyone with me on that? Here's your weekly. Take a look at the weekly off number. So it wouldn't take much to get a reversal this week. Uh, if you count back two candles on the weekly, 94.81 is a two week off number. Uh, but I'm thinking up here around 96 ish might be it. I know a lot of people all the way back down here were looking for 97 and calling this a bear market rally before the next leg down. Although there are a lot of dollar bulls that are looking for new highs. Uh, I'm thinking that we're going to have a failure, maybe break back down to 90, uh, 89 after we peak in here and then get a better dollar rally from there. Everyone with me? Kind of have an idea of what my thoughts are. So there's nothing actionable there for me right now. But I, I do want to test out a theory here. And I know most of you guys think that all I do is I top and bottom pick here uh, and I do a lot of it because of my RSI work and three drive formations but uh, I also teach that when you have confirmed highs uh, this is euro pound here's your one hour I mean this explosion after the BOE look at the momentum up here I think we had an RSI reading of 84 88 uh, very intense. So I'm viewing this as a correction off this, call it a flagpole if you want to get be conventional here. And I'm looking to, you know, scale in here, you know, have a piece on here, have a piece on if it breaks a 61.8. Uh, if it forces me to at 78.6 being wrong under the low of the move. So it's really not a huge risk. I mean, even from here, it's only 90 pips. And one of the reasons for my belief in this is markets rarely peak on confirmed highs. Okay. It would be the exception, not the rule. If you've been following my, th my thesis and things that I pay attention to, um, you know that I don't even look for turning points in the market until momentum is waning and not confirming and not just once, but at least a couple of times. And everyone knows my ideal readings for RSI for shorts and longs. Uh, and the other part of this equation is what I see on the weekly, which to me may be incomplete. Uh, here we go. My screen, uh, I think you need to go, uh, Abdul, uh, log out come back in because i have the audience view right in front of me and i could see the whole chart so here's one here's two and i think that there's a possibility for a three you know maybe up towards this 94 level let's take a, a real macro look on the monthly 
you know, so you could see one, two, three. So the bigger macro picture tells me that we may have an incomplete pattern here. So looking to buy it wrong under these lows, it was contained by the 200 moving on the daily. So we get through there, we could have a pretty good run. So that's my best guess on this for now. And I'm just using bid levels to uh, enter the trade. May have to do some work and rally and fill back in, but uh, this is another reason I think the dollar is starting to run out of juice, even though there might be another 100 pips in the dollar index here. So EG is uh, on my radar screen. You're back, okay, you see everything all right? Okay. How are you, Windsor? Any questions for me before I pass it on? Full screen, good. What was the pair you were in trouble with, Euro Kiwi? Oh, yeah, and I also want to update you. know, last week I was pretty negative on Euro Swiss right here, up at the FIB level. I don't know how many took me seriously or not but I, I'd be covering it here. It's a nice trade, you know, about 60 pips from here. Told people to cover it last night. We had this bounce and we're failing here. So actually uh, Euro Swiss has held up better than Euro. You know, we could, uh, you know, earlier I was thinking 112, but you know, it's a long week and we'll see what happens, but this ended up being a decent call. Some of you guys catch it. Euro Swiss, and you were looking at Euro Kiwi. You want remember, I'm I'm the host of Forex Analytics. Uh, starting to, we need new lows. Uh, I don't see a reason to buy it yet, but I wouldn't be short here. We're starting to diverge but it's kind of a flat pattern. I'd like to see it break down and then something like this, let it do what it's gonna to do to the downside. And then the next time we're back above this level. So even if we went to 750, next time back above old support, which will become new resistance, I think you could go long. I think if you're long now, you're probably a little bit early, but uh, we're kindred spirits. I'm always early. So if you're using proper leverage, you don't have to worry about it. If you're over leverage, you have to worry about every trade, every trade. So if you if you use reduced leverage, say, for example, normally you're a one lot trader and you're long from here with a point two, you don't care if it breaks to another 50 pips on the downside, right? You wanted to, so you could build your position. But if you're over leveraged at 20, 30 to one, then every tick, every pip is life and death to you. Do not make any, do not make any one trade too important to you. Well, good hunting, Abdul, I hope it works out for you. And with that being said, I'd like to hand it over to my partner, Blake Morrill, and see what Blake is thinking going into this week. I think it's kind of a light news week. It is. So, yeah, it is. it's light, huh, buddy? It is light. Yeah, it's it's a pretty. It's a well, pretty you know light. what? Let's then. You know what? Let us make some news. Here's the news. Face is the best free FX room on the net. And I think that's newsworthy. That is newsworthy. <laughs> that is. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, uh, I hope you guys are having a, or had a great weekend. Um, it is, uh, it, it's actually, um, it's, it, it is pretty slow out there, but some really interesting moves last night. So um, first, first, first and foremost, uh, the euro dollar. I, it, you know, let's just talk about the euro. The euros, you know, once again near some pretty key support here and. Um, you know, we have this big head and shoulder pattern. We tested the neckline on Friday and we're, we're approaching like the, the trend lows, which, 
you know, in, in my opinion, looks like it could could continue to break lower. But the real interesting move overnight was the dollar yen, and the dollar yen um, okay. spiked up above resistance last night. Uh, you can see it pushed above resistance, and the reason why it pushed above resistance is um, uh, uh, Kuroda came on uh, the wires, and he said. I have to go. Let me let me see if I can find the news. You know that was the action you were looking for on the NFP, buddy. Yeah. And it ended up you got the same action just a day later. Uh, Steve, Steve's trying to break in and say something. What's up, Steve? I remember exactly what he said because I have to admit it was freaking impressive. He said that powerful stimul uh, stimulus is going to continue indefinitely. Something yeah. like this, something the like OJ that. The will persistently continue power. Yeah. <laughs> this is his yeah. comments from last yeah. night. And um, and I was like, what? Okay, so so anyway, that pushed the the you know, and 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 Donald Trump, I think, I don't know if it's it was here, yeah. Uh, right now, our trade with Japan is not free or reciprocal. Uh, that came in just a little bit before that, actually a few minutes just before that. And um, the, the dollar yen pushed above that resistance and it pushed some stops. And I'm like, you know, I, 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 was, at the, I was at the grocery store and because uh, I had to pick up my, my, uh, my, my wife and my, um, my youngest, is, they're, they're just not feeling too well probably not this morning either. Uh, I went to go pick up some some good fresh chicken noodle soup, you know, cuz you know just because that that's usually what you, we feed people when they're when they're when they're not feeling too good. Uh, and it's and a I was very like, kind of silent, like Jewish yeah, kind of silent. I was, it is. I was raised on it, it is. <laughs> um, and, and when I was and I was sitting there looking at the dollar yen and I was in the grocery store and I'm like, you know, if the dollar yen can't break out on those comments I don't know what's going to break the dollar yen out. And and when I you know when I came back we were trading at you know we 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 had spiked up and we came back down we were trading around 50s and then I I sat there last night and I'm like all right this is a you know was a a, a failed breakout. We hit the you know triangle resistance. Um I there's a lot of time left in today but if we close negative on the dollar yen that's going to be a pretty bearish event uh, for for the dollar yen, and, and and so that's something that I think everybody should be paying attention to. I, I had to put in a, a a pattern in play there because we were up against resistance once again, um, because you know it it. it it might end up being a failed breakout. So yeah, a break below like one thirteen fifty. That's gonna that's probably gonna you know trigger some shorts or some some selling because there's a lot of people that got stopped out of their short positions last night when we broke above that 114.50. So that was a very interesting move last night. Um, th this is going to be a fairly mm -hmm. interesting week for the Aussie New Zealand. And actually I had to take, I took Personally, I took some losses in the Aussie New Zealand. I've been, you know, trading on the long side when we broke above this, uh, you know, well, when we we actually broke this 111.50 or whatever it was, uh, and and then I took it off here. I, I just I took I took a, a loss because we got the we have the RBA tonight, which uh, I, with the with the recent string of economic data, I can't imagine they're going to be super hawkish. So we might come back under pressure, and then the RBNZ is going to be on Wednesday night or Thursday morning. And um, I think if if I have to imagine what's going to happen is the the Aussie New Zealand is going to do this, and then then bounce because the the RBNZ I don't think is going to even though the 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 economic data out of um, New Zealand has been better. I don't know how hawkish they're going to be because of um, just because of everything that you know is happening in on the political front in New Zealand, so uh, I'm actually going to look to buy the Aussie New Zealand on a dip if I can this week. If we end up dipping down towards 110, that's where I, I, I'd like to reestablish a long position personally. And so anyway, I had to take uh, I had to take a loss on my on my Aussie New Zealand as a result. But like I said, it's it's it, you know. If I can get a better price later on this week, I'm I'm hoping to do that. 
you know, we never know. We may we we may end up just rallying significantly from here and go straight up from here. Uh, that that's 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 possible, especially when you have two central banks meeting at the same time. Um, if you if you didn't watch the week ahead video, uh, I, I highly recommend that you do because I, I talked about the dollar and about the the dollar. You know, everybody's bullish the dollar right now. I mean, we've we've got you know we've got the dollar that's 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 you know got this big inverted head and shoulder pattern. We're up against this 161 percent extension, but uh, all in all, the dollar looks pretty bullish here. But at the same time, there are dollar pairs that you know are struggling, and one of them being the dollar yen. Um, you know, we we looked at the dollar Canadian, which is which is. You know, some people look at the dollar Canadian as being the canary in the coal mine, and it's not, it's not following through with dollar bullishness right now. Matter of fact, it's starting to turn lower. We have the dollar yen that's struggling up at resistance. Um, you know, we have uh, the U.S. dollar Norwegian krona that's, you know, it's trying to build its, you know, bullish formation, but at the at the same time, it's not going up anymore uh us dollar swedish krona is right at resistance we have a lot of a lot of dollar pairs that are you know that are somewhat struggling right now and that is you know that 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 to me is something that i think that um people should be aware of and then on top of it all which i didn't look at at the uh on the video which is something that uh that that i i should have done but i it, it spaced. I spaced it at the time of filming, and then after the fact, I was like, "Oh man, I should have uh, talked about bonds." Bonds have been, you know, we, we've come off of our lows here in the bond market, and and bonds. I mean, we're past the six one eight retracement just from the last couple of weeks worth of move, and the bonds get above this two hundred day moving average. That means that yields are coming down, and if yields come down, that's typically bearish the dollar, and and everybody right now, I, I think, is universally bullish the dollar at this time um so i'm not i'm not 100 percent convinced that 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 this is the week that the dollar continues to rally we might see a little bit of consolidation if not possible pullback in some of these dollar pairs so i you know that's my that's my thought process at the moment and um and 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 again, I, it is as you pointed out, Dale. It's a fairly light week as far as news goes. There's not a whole lot going on, except for the RBA. We have Draghi speaking uh, tomorrow. Uh, where is Draghi speaking at? Speaking of which, he is um, the pizza parlor. He's talking at the pizza parlor. No, he is talking uh, opening remarks at the ECB forum on banking supervision in Frankfurt uh, tomorrow. Uh, morning, we have Polas and Yellen that are both speaking tomorrow as well. So we got some central bank speak there. Uh, the yeah. RBNZ is Thursday morning or Wednesday night here in the in in, in North American trade, and then um, um, that that's pretty much it as far as really important data points. So uh, you know, is there a lot of catalyst this week? For the dollar to continue to break higher, I don't necessarily think so. And um, you know the and what's always the risk is you know the further we push up in in equities, um, you know the, the 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 closer we are to a some sort of correction. Which what we've seen is you know if the if the stock market corrects, the dollar is likely to uh, to 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 correct as well. So that you know that that to me is is something that you know also worries me about um, people being too aggressively long the dollar. I, I do want to point up uh, point out the pound though. Um, the pound this might be the exception to the rule when you're talking about the dollar. Uh, I, I I'm 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 so um, focused right now on the pound dollar at the 130 level. As long as it holds above 130, it's fine. You know, there's nothing to really worry about. If the pound dollar breaks 130, I am I would be expecting a very big 
you know, correction in not only the pound, but also pound currencies. So um, we, we should be keeping a very close eye on the cable. And, and, it, it, and just for, but, but for right now, I mean, we're bouncing off of this, uh, this, this trend line support. You can see how, you know, we have this big trend line support. We're bouncing off of it right now, which is that big triangle support. Risk rewarded, risk reward favors being long the pound right now. Although that's completely opposite of the bearish or not bearish, the um, dovish tone that the Bank of England took uh, last week. So, you know, if, if the pound does bounce here, I, I would assume that the bounce would be fairly limited. I personally, after hearing the Bank of England last week and all the concerns with, uh, with, with, you know, uh, Brexit coming up and, and, and inflation forecasts and growth forecasts, I would be more, I'd be more apt to sell the pound on a rally at this point because it, 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 it does, it does look technically pretty weak at the moment but but then again you know if the dollar does pull back a little bit then that's just going to weigh that that's going to allow the pound to bounce further so um not like i'm establishing a short right now but i will be watching the cable on any type of rally if we get any type of rally any type of significant rally i might i might use that as an opportunity to, to sell some some pounds you know some cable um at some point this week and i don't know you know when that is or when that might be but that's something that 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 i'm actually paying attention to now now abdul um abdul took a look at or he wanted to take a look at the euro new zealand um dale i know you looked at the euro new zealand yeah but let's take a real quick look at this the, this euro new zealand I, I i find it rather interesting because here let's Let's say right here, and and Dale, do you remember what um, Abdul was looking at with the Euro New Zealand? He's long. He has about a forty pip stop from right here. Stepped away. Can you guys hear me? Best. No, I'm here. Okay. Can you hear me? All right. Um, Abdul said he was long Euro New Zealand. Okay, thanks, Abdul. So yeah, it, and he was long with this, a forty pip stop right from here, around here, as you can see, yeah. very important, and. We have a, uh, you know, a, a, what I what I see is a wedge. Okay, so we have we have a wedge. Um, my concern would be, in, the, in this in this case, it is actually a bearish wedge. All right, that 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 actually, you know, when you have consistent lows and lower highs, the risk is, or the the higher probability is a break lower. It doesn't mean it it has to happen that way, but um, you know, it's more likely that it's going to break lower. But if it breaks higher and we break above this 169, I think you're in really good shape. Then, then you have the, you know, because if I had to throw a percentage on it, I would say, well, you know, 40 to 45 percent of the time it's going to break higher, and you know, 60 to you know, 55 to 60, to maybe 65 percent of the time it's going to break lower. So you have, you have, uh, you have the opportunity to go either direction, more potential breaking lower, but that doesn't necessarily mean it has to. And if, if you think about what's happening in New Zealand, I'd be more, I'd be more apt to, to short the Kiwi, frankly. But you know, looking at this, I, I wouldn't be interested in buying the Euro New Zealand until we broke above 169, just because I know this formation tends to yield more of a, a, a bearish outcome than a bullish outcome. Uh, you know, if you're if you're going to flip heads or tails. So anyway, I. You have a view on EG. I uh, Dale would like to know. I'm pointing that out just so you you have a good idea where I stand. And, and matter of fact, this looks like it's about a 50% retracement. Let's just double check something. From this low to this high, yeah, it is a 50% retracement. So, you know that you can see why we're really well supported. The problem is, is if you break through these lows, I mean, it could it can open up a a, a move, you know quite a bit lower and so i think that's that's the that's the risk at, at this at this stage in the game abdul so hopefully that helps you out um and do you guys hear dale is dale speaking because yeah, i'm here i'm here but Steve, you can't you hear? hear me can hear uh, dale uh, See, i can't hear you guys i my my sound is off and let me just say something really quick because I can't hear any of you guys um, and you guys can hear everybody else. 
when we have uh, multiple um, staff come in, I've, I've, I've known this over the years, if we have multiple staff comes in, sometimes when one person comes in, it boots the other person off from an, for audio. So um, I'm going to pass it over to Dale and probably log out because somehow when, when one person logged on, it knocked off my audio like where I can't hear. So I'm going to pass it back over to Dale now and, um, and let you guys take over from here. Okay, Blake. Okay, mate. I'm gonna, okay, so Steve, you could take it. All right, it's it's your turn. It's your turn anyway, so you can take the screen. <laughs> sure. And I'm I'm interested. Uh, you know, some guy in the audience, his name's Forrest Stop Hunter, wants to know what Volgi thinks of Europound. Europound, yeah, sure. Uh, I don't think much of it actually. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You want you want even date it? I wouldn't date it, no, 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 until it goes a little <laughs> bit more. Um, All right. what, what I think about it, um, you know, I I tended to um, believe that this rebound was corrective. Um, I had even labeled it. And, um, you know, I, I was looking for a move lower towards uh, at least the support. And then uh you know we got we got a big boe move and this huge yeah. candle so i have to tell yeah. you that despite not having destroyed uh, the whole concept uh, it makes me a lot more skeptical okay, okay. um so uh on the other hand uh, the, the, the figure have... would change over the high that we had a couple of days ago listen short term anyway Yes, but so far what I can tell you is the following is that in essence what we did is more or less create like a double bottom here at uh, 087.40 let's call it and yeah. we also have these highs and as long as we uh, as we remain between them I, I, I still remain like slightly tilted to the bearish side because you know that 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 was what I believed prior to that but you know usually this kind of days like the one we had then uh, usually they don't get just you know erased uh so um i i would i would have no position at the moment i mean i understand if somebody wanted to to short that high so like as an exa exacerbated reaction that would have been a good short-term trade but uh, now if that still maintains the hopes for another push to new lows I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, so I wouldn't Fair be doing enough. absolutely nothing here. Yeah, I want to. I want to wait to see some kind of resolution, uh, either you know moving below uh, 8740, uh, or if we move above 9030. Obviously, you know that changes completely uh, the concept uh, because that uh, probably transforms. Um, this move lower to something corrective and not to something new impulsive. So I, I need to see more price action to tell. Okay. Okay. Uh, having to do with Euro Kiwi since we since we uh, were talking about it before. Thank you. Um, since we were talking about the Euro Kiwi, I, I still remain uh, I still remain constructive on the pair. Uh, but I'm also looking for the possibility of uh, you know that's what we had seen. Uh, several days ago, like um, you know, uh, a push higher. We we came higher. We retested perfectly the um, the channel resistance. But yes, we can drop lower from here before we go higher. But I wouldn't be actually uh, shorting the pair. I would be looking for opportunities to buy the pair. Okay, I still don't see a signal to do so. Uh, but you know, uh, I, I think that somebody, you know, somebody looking to buy it is the right way to to approach it. Is is the right mentality until proven otherwise. Okay. Uh, so let let me open the the question window and let's have a look of what people want to see, and then we can show several stuff. Okay, WTI is interesting. Let's see. Uh, WTI is getting interesting. I may short it at 56.50, uh, 
uh, Arif says. I don't know what you're seeing specifically, Arif, but we can have a look at it. I mean, I don't know if you're seeing something specific at, at 56.50. I, I was looking at uh, the 55.50 uh, area to provide resistance. It did so, but only for a couple of days, and then we penetrated above it, uh, which shows me that you know uh, oil is even stronger than I thought. I, I thought it would give us the ability to uh, you know to buy it again at around 53. That didn't happen. Uh, so the next area of interest I actually have is at uh, the 127.2 at uh, 54. Uh, 58.50. So, um, if you have something specific that you're seeing at 56.50, I would I would want to see it. Okay. Uh, so, because currently, you know, I have no. I mean, besides the fact that it's overbought uh, on the short term, there's no question about it. The RSI has already reached 75, uh, and at some point, obviously, it should pull back. I don't see something specific that would, you know, get me short at. 56.50, but I'm I'm open to suggestions if you're seeing something. Otherwise, then the next real target I see is, as I said, is 58.50, and there is no question that uh, crude remains uh, constructive. Uh, would like your opinion on on Eurocad, uh, Martin? Yeah, sure, Martin. Let's have a look at Eurocad. Okay. Okay, Eurocad is currently at some type of support as you see here we have this trend line it's not a perfect trend line uh, and you know I also have this zone that I'm monitoring so I would tell you that um, for the time being this can easily be just an ABC um, I would be in the lookout for 147.30 as major support I think that uh, a break below there confirms that you know something bigger is brewing to the downside, I mean. Uh, until we do that, I wouldn't ex exclude the possibility of an ABC and the, and the push higher. But in general, um, if I remember the same applies to Euro NOC, we've, we've talked about it, yeah, uh, and to EuroCAD. You know, I don't like the structure at all because this structure is just some kind of big consolidation because the moves we see in either direction, none of them is impulsive. I mean, if we had Gregor here, I haven't done any Elliott Wave analysis on them, and I, I don't really care because, you know, sometimes when things look very clear on the eye, you know, I don't care to, you know, to, to micromanage it because I simply don't want to get involved. But, uh, you know, neither of these moves, down, up, down, up, uh, are impulsive, which means that uh, something that just keeps doing um, three-wave moves one direction and then the other, etc., is is in a bigger consolidation and I really don't care to be involved with it. So uh, my personal idea is that I you know I gave you this support area. I think it's you know the the, the market considers it somewhat important, but probably I would be looking elsewhere. Uh, that that's my best advice. I mean find something else uh, that has higher probability of playing out. Uh, Abdul says, I guess I was early in, in longing Euro Kiwi. Yeah, you might have been, but nobody says that it can, can't turn from here. For example, we, had, we have this high Abdul at 167.65. That might act as uh, support. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, you might have been early, but, you know, we have no confirmation yet about that. You might, you might, you might get lucky. Uh, no, there is very high concentrated long position in the COD report. Yes, I agree with uh, with that, Arif. But keep in mind that um, uh, COT and sentiment reports um, are very good contrarian indicators, but they lack one element, and that element is timing. I mean, they give you a broad idea that something is uh, extended. But that doesn't mean that it, can, it cannot get extended for another week. So, for example, 58.50 can also happen before we turn lower. Uh, Hassan says, Steve, would love to take your uh, take on the Nikkei. Definitely. Okay, actually, you know something? I was looking at the Nikkei yesterday, completely out of curiosity. I did the following thing.
Okay, the Nikkei was in a, an ascending triangle, okay? And then it, you know, it, it exploded higher, starting to follow this red channel, which if you, if you look at it, uh, it, it, it has an angle of 54 degrees. Okay, so it's like a, an extremely steep ascending channel. And then, actually, if, if, if you look at it carefully, it actually started following a, an even steeper uh, ascending channel, which is at 62 degrees. Um, I mean, you, I, I, I can only manage to find this, this kind of um, uh, rate of um, appreciation in cryptocurrencies. It's, you know, this, this, this rate of, uh, this pace of increase is like unsustainable. But, you know, as nuts as it is, does that constitute some some specific kind of uh, you know indicator? It's like the COD's report that we were saying before on the sentiment reports. The answer is no. So can it extend even to crazier levels before it actually goes down to you know mid Earth? Probably, uh, probably it can. On the other hand, though, and I have to say this. Um, by, by the way, speaking of CODs and, D, and uh, sentiment, I have to tell you that uh, the DSI, the Daily Sentiment Index for the Nikkei, uh, was um, 95 on Wednesday. It's probably one of the most extreme readings I've seen. And in general, it, it's, it has spent all, all the previous week above 88, which, which is like simply nuts. We actually tagged to the pip the 127.2 of this move lower so uh, being on a resistance because of the channels here and being on the 127.2 i would tell you that and being so extremely overextended um we we even have like um, a diverging rsi but at very very high levels so this this does not constitute such a reliable divergence because usually the most reliable type of divergence just to you know to 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 talk about theory a little bit here the most reliable type of the divergence you have on the rsi is usually seeing the rsi diverge but the beginning of the, the divergence you would ideally want want it to be above 70 uh, but the rest of the di divergence you would like to see it drop below 70. so usually divergences at so high readings are less reliable than a divergence you would see with the first peak being, let's say, at 75, then the next one being at 70, and then, let's say, the third one being at, let's say, 67. You understand what I mean? That would be a more reliable divergence, but, but still, RSI is also diverging. So I would tell you that I'm expecting a, re, a correction lower to, to come at any given day. I didn't expect that we, we could even extend as high as we did. This is one of the craziest uh, moves I recently remember having seen. And by recently, I mean like in a couple of years, okay? I'm excluding cryptocurrencies, I, I repeat. So um, this is a perfect level. It can happen from here. But, you know, be very careful being short such a market. It's, you know, it's, it's very dangerous. Um, pound Aussie and Pound Kiwi. Let's have a look at them. Um, okay. The pound Aussie remains somewhat elusive recently because, you know, it gives us, I mean, here, for example, it, it was creating a pennant. It first broke below it, got people trapped in the wrong direction or people that were long stopped out. Then it moved to new highs. Then it plunges lower, back below uh, this area and within this triangle. And, you know, it, it has started becoming more and more choppy. Uh, I can tell you one thing. First of all, we're now testing resistance. So if we turn lower from there, I expect another move lower towards here before perhaps moving higher. Um, given the uh, couple of days we had, uh, with the biggest one being the one, of course, of uh, the BOE. I doubt that it's on its way to new highs from here. 
I think that it should at least sell off once more before attempting new highs. Okay, so that's what I think about the pound Aussie. Let's go to the pound Kiwi. Now, the pound Kiwi is cleaner uh, in the sense that, you know, it, it, it created a triangle, it broke above it as you would expect in a triangle, it broke to new highs, and out of this huge uh, bottoming formation and its resistance, it tagged the 127.2 of this move lower to the pip. I mean, on, on a daily closing basis, really to the pip. It came down to retest this broken resistance, and for the time being, it's reacting from there. So, uh, so far, so good. Now, what happens from here is, you know, what counts more. I think that even if it drops down to 186 to trap some people, uh, you know, short, it can still rebound and go to new highs. Uh, so I would want to be long the pound Kiwi, uh, but I'm not sure I should be doing it yet. That's why I'm still monitoring. Okay. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for, for more price action here as well. I'm not convinced it's, it's going to new highs from here. I like the fact that it reacted though from here, but I'm not convinced. The, rea the, the, the you know, the rebound still is, is not strong enough. I, I need to see more. Okay, Arif, uh, thanks from Euro Kiwi. My pleasure, um, Abdul. Uh, Aussie, yeah, of course. Let's have a look at the Aussie and the Kiwi. Okay, the Aussie is trying to rebound once again from the 61.8. Uh, personally, I'm not I'm not buying so much on the possibility of a rebound. Even if it happens, I expect it to be shallow. Uh, I remain bearish uh, the Aussie USD, especially as long as we remain uh, below this 77.40 area. Um, I remain bearish, you know. Uh, no questions asked. So um, only if we rebound higher from there, I can start looking at you know other resistances, etc. Until then, uh, I'm outright bearish. Uh, having to do with Kiwi, same here as as long as we remain below 69.70. So I was I was looking at the possibility of another push higher for for Kiwi specifically, uh, but also here I'm you know. I'm, I'm very bearish and uh, I'm expecting another leg lower. So both of them I expect, uh, you know, another leg lower at least. Use the CAD. Sure, let's have a look at it. I'm not convinced that the USD CAD is done, actually. And as a matter of fact, I'm not convinced about USD knock as well. And you can see why here. I'm going to show you USD CAD, but uh, USD, USD knock, I think it's even cleaner because uh, you have a pennant, it depends on how we draw it because, you know, this is an ongoing consolidation. So this looks to me like something that wants to move higher. Initially, we were looking of the possibility of another move lower, and it's still likely, but now it looks like it, it wants at least one more leg higher before lower. Okay, um, use the CAD. I, I said that... I would ideally want it to reach 130 uh, because we had this nice, nice confluence of the horizontal resistance and the 200 EMA before moving lower. It didn't do so. Uh, it started moving lower, but am I convinced that this is actually, you know, uh, the beginning of another move to new lows? No, I'm not yet. I'm not yet. And, you know, the the move lower has been decently and inspiring, so I, I need a lot more evidence. Um, definitely the fact that we close below 128 is, okay, good. Um, and if I see another rejection from here, so for example, if I see like something like this, I'm going to start thinking about it. Uh, but for the time being, I remain neutral and, you know, I want to see more price action. In the grand scheme of things and the medium term, I remind you that I'm expecting a new low in the USD card. So that has not changed. But I'm just not convinced that this is coming from here and it's it, it's coming now. Okay. It, I mean, I'm not convinced that it, it has rolled over yet. So we need more price action to be able to, to say so and determine.
Abdul says, I'm thinking of going long uh, pound card. Sure, let's have a look at it. That might prove an okay trade uh, if we take this as a triangle because the uh, inverted head and shoulders uh, you know, neck, neckline has now been violated. So in essence, that's not in play anymore, at least you know, from a theoretical standpoint. Uh, but I would tell you that you don't really want to see this area break okay because things get a lot more complicated then so yes uh, might work but you want to you want to see this area holding roughly let's call it 165 80 the area around it so um as long as this holds yeah you can attempt it the reward to risk ratio is there Luca, I'm also long uh, the Ibex, mate. Let me show your chart. I'm also long Ibex. Let me show your chart. Yep, that's exactly what I'm seeing as well. A retest of the breakout area. Yep, that's why I'm also long. So we, we are together in this. Uh, USD yen. Yeah, let me tell you what I'm seeing in the USD yen. Actually, this is what I see in the USD yen. Okay, we had the blue triangle. I expected a break higher from there. It happened. Now I can't say that I don't see this as a possible ascending wedge. Also, the inability of the USD yen to push higher faster is troubling. Okay. So, um, although we can easily reach the 116 uh, area, 115, 60, 116 area, which I was targeting, um, I, I see the possibility of a failure before that. But in order for that to happen, I want to see this ascending wedge break lower. Okay, that hasn't happened yet. Yes, this price action, though, is not bullish because we had like extremely powerful uh comments from kuroda and the initial market reaction higher was uh, very uh, uh, shiftly um you know uh pared back and usually this kind of price action does you know does not uh point out to a bullish behavior uh yeah the nikkei is more than crazy abdul uh Hey, what's your count on this CHFJPY? Oh my God, why would you want to see that? I don't even know if I have any analysis on it. Because, you know, they're so similar pairs. And if I have it, I don't even know where I would have it. You know, that both of them, both of them are um, risk of pairs and, you know, they, they, they share characteristics, the Swissy and the Yen. So usually it it's a very very boring pair to look at. Uh, yeah, yeah. Although as you see, it has been trending. I have to be honest. But generally, you know, I avoid trading uh, pairs with very very similar char characteristics. That's why I very rarely trade, for example, the Aussie Kiwi, and that's why I would rarely trade this one. Um, I can tell you one thing for sure. This move higher is not corrective, is not impulsive. I can tell you that much. This overlapping move higher is not impulsive. Let's have a look at some fibs. Okay, we hit the 50% fib of this move lower almost perfectly. We got rejected. We're now down at the 200 DMA, but
only then I'm convinced it's going lower. Otherwise, it's possible that, you know, more chopping around might continue with this within this ascending triangle. Okay, so um, I think that there is a trade here only if we break below 112.70, roughly. Okay. Alternatively, of course, you can decide to play. Let me see. Alternatively, you can decide to play. I haven't even drawn it correctly. Let me see. Uh, you can decide to play this possible, let's say, triangle. Although we only have, you know, two two touches so far. So no, there's there's nothing to do here. If you see, for example, a move lower towards there, and this area holding and starting a rebound, you know, then you can decide to play that. That's what I think. So, you know, look at this area if you really need to do something here. A break lower, I think it's, you know, a very bearish event. There's no question about it. Um, you know, a rebound from there can yield some, you know, decent upside. So, you know, this is all I see here. But as I said, I wouldn't be involved with that. Dow and S&P. Yes, we can definitely have a look at them. Although I, I honestly have nothing new to add. Um, I mean, we remain in uptrend. There is no question about it. There is also no question that there is momentum loss here, right? And somebody can view SPX, for example, you can view this as an ascending wedge. But we need confirmation. Soon, sooner rather than later, there's going to be a correction lower. They are also overextended, not in the extent that Nikkei is. I mean, nothing is that much overextended uh, outside the cryptocurrency world. But uh, definitely, we had no uh, decent correction in a very, very long time. And if I'm not mistaken, the daily close on the VIX on Friday was. I think it was an all time low, having not intraday, having to do with uh, closing prices. Let me see, let me check this out. Yeah, I think it was, if I remember right. I think the daily close we had on the VIX on Friday was an all time low, an all time uh, closing low. That's we we are opening. Well, Steve, I remember reading the same thing. Ah, okay. Yeah. So that's the case. So how, you know, how much quieter things can be, can become? I doubt much more. Okay. And you know something, VIX is pushing lower. Uh, the market keeps ignoring anything negative, etc. Uh, stocks are drifting higher. But you know, it's how much more new money can come in before at least we see like two, three percent lower of a correction. I, I doubt too much. So definitely I wouldn't be buying here. I'm actually short here um, still and, and I'm waiting for some kind of a correction. I'm not expecting this to be the high of the trend, right? Let me be very clear. But I do believe that, you know, we, we, we will soon correct lower. Um, another target I have higher for the SPX, uh, if we do push higher from here, is uh, the 2,609 area. Okay. Uh, which is a FIB level, um, I think that, you know, maximum from there we should see a reaction lower. But, you know, that's not something really scientific. It's like a combination of factors that makes me think that a move lower should come soon. That's it. And, you know, areas I would be looking for, I can tell you that in advance as well. Uh, first of all, there is no real break in the SPX until we clear 2,545, okay? Um, and, uh, you know, I think that anything down to 2,485 is gonna be perfect. I mean, we don't even break the uptrend. I mean, we can literally move 100 handles lower and we still have a very healthy uptrend. So even a little correction 
can be 100 handles lower, right? I'm getting ready to short USD yen, just waiting for Nikkei to correct, Abdul says. Yeah, they, they look like they're about to do that. Uh, HCHF versus Abdul, more, more or less I agree, although although I've, I've had much, much luck in the past with Euro Swiss, so, you know, I can hate them in, you know, uh, all of them. Uh, Euro Swiss at least has made me a happy man in the past. Uh, shorted Euro TRY yesterday, says Abdul. Let's have a look at it. And Kiwi Yen looking vulnerable again, says Luca. Let's let's have a look at the Aussie Kiwi and uh, the Aussie Yen and the Kiwi Yen, and then we're going to look at the uh, Euro Turkish Lira. Okay, um, Aussie Yen probably in a triangle at the moment within the bigger formation that we see here for which we are in the middle. Bottom line, not much to do here, okay? You can play the inner triangle if you want, but honestly, I like, you know, more obvious setups. Now, Kiwi Yen, Luca, and thank you for reminding me because I was actually looking at it today in the morning. Kiwi Yen so far has had a beautiful drop below this well proven uh, to the market support trend line and the perfect retest and we actually got a very nice shooting star on that retest and today we're failing from there once again so i would agree with you this looks like a very very interesting setup uh let's see how we close today as well uh, and you know I, i'm i'm probably going to be involved with that as well Uh, okay, yes, Ronit, I agree with that. Let's have a look at the Euro TRY, since our friend Abdul is shorting it. Yeah, definitely extended, there's no question about that. And I'm guessing that what you believe is that this is some type of an ascending wedge. Uh, I would still s need to see a break below 4.45, you know, to get interested about it. Until then, no real confirmation. Might work, might work. I mean, this can end up being uh, an ascending wedge after the overthrow of this, like, much much larger megaphone formation that we had here so it might it might uh it's just too early for my taste i, I at least want to see you know some type of a support breaking like at the very minimum 445 but you know best for more confirmation is probably this little area here which is like 438 call it because don't forget, this is a huge, huge uptrend, right? So you have, you have to, to put things in context. Just look at it. It's massive. I mean, back here in 2010, uh, the pair was trading at 185, and we're currently at 450. 450. I mean, just, just look at this. 150% higher, right? And this is a currency pair. It, if it was, you know, if it was stocks, yeah, sure. I mean, within these, you know, so many years, yeah, easily. But this is a currency pair. I mean, you don't often see these kind of moves. It's like the Midnight Express. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, 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 we've talked about it before. Uh, if you remember, remember that's the all I think. About. I had actually watched it when I was very young, and I remember that it, it had made an, an impact. Is that when you, you decided not to go into the smuggling business? <laughs> yeah, not exactly. It's not only that. The guy was, if I remember right, he was smuggling drugs specifically, right? Right, right. It's not that he was smuggling, you know, s something that's like more innocent. <laughs> it was just, you know, not, not uh, uh, legal to, to take it out right. of the country. It was yeah. it was drugs. Yeah, something tell, tells me that you know he regretted that. <laughs> yeah. 
Looks like a three drive up there, maybe. Tough call, but could be. Yeah, it can be. It can be. But in, in such an uptrend, yeah. you need to be careful. You need to be careful. I agree with you. And once again, though, it's what I said before. This RSI divergence it is not the most reliable type of RSI divergence because all it's peaks 70. are yeah. above 70. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But it can work. Definitely it can work. But it, as I said, for my taste, it's a little bit of premature. Okay. As long as you 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 have your risk well defined, though, it should be okay. I mean, you know, you're a man of your own. You you, you know uh, how you like to trade. I'm well, sure. You... Unlike Midnight Express, uh, trading the lira, the worst thing that could happen is you get stopped out, not locked in. Yes, of course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Absolutely. And, so, you know, I, for whoever has seen the movies, the movie, they know that it's not only about being locked in, it's about where you're getting locked in. <laughs> not all places are the same to get locked in into. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> yeah. I, okay, who do we have today? We have Kevin Araijo and uh, Magic Kev is going to uh, show us some magic with uh, some of the, the work he does that you were talking about earlier, Steve, on commitment of traders reports, on on how they're good for having a theme, but uh, the timing is the art. Yeah, you need you need all, uh, you need other elements for timing. A technical analysis right. is always the timing indicator. Right. I mean, just think of them as pieces of the puzzle. The more pieces you have from the puzzle, the easiest it is for you to see the picture that's, you know, displayed in the puzzle. But okay. you know, the, the the actual the the actual key ingredient. I mean, the, the the key part of the puzzle is always technical analysis because that's the only type of analysis. I mean, regardless which type of technical analysis you use, is yeah. it Elliott wave? It's, is it it's always harmonic? price action. Isn't it? Yes, it's always price action that's going to give you the trigger. The other things might be telling you for some time that listen, you know, this thing, for example, is going to move lower. Okay. Fine, but when you know technical analysis is going to tell you, yeah. okay, now it's happening. Now it's about the to one. happen, or now it's the, the one is the art. Happened. Yeah, the one is the art of it. Yeah. So good, exactly. great job, buddy. As usual, thank you for thank you. En thank you enjoy for the your... interview. Okay, thank you, Steve. So Kevin, bye bye. See you tomorrow, guys. Uh, and girls. Although although the World Series has concluded with Houston beating the Dodgers, I think their first World Series victory in history. Thank you for pinch hitting and coming in today and looking forward to hearing your voice and taking a look at some of your looks and your charts. And here we are. Hi, Kevin. Hi, good morning, Dale. How are you? Great, buddy. Thank you for stepping up and coming in today and uh, also returning. I hey, think man, not a problem. I'm glad to be here. So uh, what caught my attention when I was uh, just, you know, looking at Twitter was you had a nice little tweet with a lot of uh, COT data. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, we've been talking about uh, COT that, you know, it's great to know what commercials are doing, but, you know, they have very deep pockets. They could be real early and it doesn't matter to them because a lot of it's a hedge anyway. It's not a spec position. And so I'm curious what's lining up with what you're seeing in COT and what is co uh, corroborating that with technical action. So it looks like we're starting with oil here. Uh, yeah, I just have uh, the oil chart open. Um, would you like me to, to open up uh, some COT data? And uh, you know, let, you know uh, you're the boss. Uh, why, why don't we start here with oil? So um you know everyone's starting to pay attention to it we finally it looked like we had a weekly breakout mm -hmm. and we're following through to the upside um although i gave up on this uh, scenario i was looking for 62 for quite some time because that was the top of a weekly falling wedge and gosh we're almost there so what are you seeing up here uh, right for profit taking uh, it's perfect for profit taking because we're hitting a, a weekly supply area over here. Uh, this area here, we're hitting some supply. So I'm expecting a drop 
from this area on the weekly down to about the 58 level. Okay, that, that was kind of like the breakout area, right? Yeah, so okay. this this 58, this 58 level is a weekly demand zone because it was responsible for removing a weekly supply zone back here, right here. Right. Right. So it broke up. Now we're hitting a weekly supply. I'm expecting a drop right back down to this original area where the institutions last filled in enough demand uh, to take out the supply. And then okay. um, once we get down to this 58 area, I'm looking to open up a, a basket of long positions over here. Okay, why do you say massive? Because of uh, the potential of this weekly breakout, uh, what kind of levels do you think if we have, if and when, we have a breakout test that crude could achieve uh, down the road on an intermediate um, or long term basis? Well, let's look at a six month chart of oil and you'll see that we're reacting from a uh, six month demand zone and that's pretty, uh, pretty intense. So when you yeah. react from six and three month demand zones, uh, price usually reacts pretty aggressively and so, you know, if you take a look at the six, we're looking at a month or a six-month bullish engulfing being created right now. Um, so we have the potential to go up to the 70s and 80s easily. There's nothing to stop it once we get past this six-month uh, bearish engulf over here. Wow. So yeah. So we're uh, testing know, that area. To me, to me, uh, and I know you're you're a very good technician, by the way, Kevin. Uh, I, I kudos to you with your work, um, but you know I've interviewed some fundamentalist people, and I would have to say that to achieve some of those levels you're talking about, you know, 80s or who knows, it looks like your your long-term downtrend line is going to come up in the 90 level, almost 100. That there's going to be something geopolitically occurring for uh, that kind of catalyst. I just can't see it happening. Uh, with peace in the world and the supply demand, although demand is starting to outstrip supply. And uh, a guy I've interviewed in, in the past actually thinks there's going to be a hot conflict in uh, with Iran. And all right. the stuff that's happening in Saudi Arabia over the weekend, right. I mean, the, the prince that's always on CNBC has been arrested and uh, what's happening in Qatar. Uh, Saudi Arabia, and also think about it. What's the first thing that President Trump did after he got elected? Yeah, he, he went yeah, to he visit. Flew, yeah, he went to Saudi Arabia, and then he went to Israel. Okay, and uh, then he decertifies the, uh, the the new deal with Iran. So uh, all the pieces seem to be coming together for something like that. So. Um, I'm with you on it. Uh, and you know, people are still, I, I could almost make, uh, I know I sound like I'm interviewing myself, but I could <laughs> almost make the analogy <laughs> that, you know, people are still, after what happened into the end of the year at, in 2015, 2016, so bearish oil because, you know, the fracking and energy independence and, uh, you know, that we're more self-sufficient, that there really isn't a lot of ingrained bullishness in energy. You know, people talk about EVs and everything like that. So mm -hmm. I think that that would be one of the biggest surprises to the market would be 80, 90, 100 dollar crude. Don't you? Well, you know what? I don't know much about how uh, the, the economics is going to play into uh, the, the price of oil. All I do know is supply and demand and I look at where the institutions are buying and where they're selling and I just follow yeah. that. And that, that tends That's all to, that matters, you know. All that matters. What I just talked about is great over a beer, but it's not <laughs> actionable, right? <laughs> right, so, exactly. uh, you know, uh, I've, a tendency, I've a tendency to ramble about some <laughs> of these things that are happening in the world, but you know, Great way to break it down to, you know, just trade what you see and forget about what you hear on CNBC. Mm -hmm. So yeah. uh, go ahead. Well, that's why I use the COT report, too, is because, I mean, that's telling me exactly where the institutions 
are buying and where they're selling and what they're holding in positions, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, so that's what I do as I look at the reports that they that get released every single week, and I plug in my data into a, a spreadsheet and I've been tracking it for quite some time so I can look at the um, the positions every single week and I can see you know if they're reducing longs if they're adding shorts or what it is that they're doing and then I take that data and I look at the charts and I map out where the institutions are adding those uh, demand orders or where they're adding the supply or where they're taking profits and uh, it's based off of those levels that I'm looking to get in um, positions on the charts. Okay, so give us, since we're on oil, mm -hmm. and you have the COT up there, give us a little tutorial on what supported um, the long side of crude mm -hmm. um, uh, compared, comparing commercial positions and non-commercial positions. Um, okay, maybe, so... Meaning like the large spec small spec and the commercials are the three categories right yeah so what i only pay attention to is uh non-commercial and commercial um okay. so what i like to do since commercial is usually hedging positions and they're taking the opposite side of what the the market uh is actually doing i like to take a look at the combination of the two and get a total of what uh both the non-commercial and commercial are doing at the same time so basically essentially what i'm doing is i'm flipping the commercial long and short positions to get a better understanding of how bearish or bullish they truly are okay. um so when i look at oil for instance uh you know i take a look at their long posi positions right and i see that they they have 734,000 positions uh, long and they have 231,000 positions short so that obviously yeah. tells me that they're extremely long uh, biased and if you take a look at both sides of those positions I get a calculation telling me that 76 percent of all of the total positions are geared to the long side and so this, that, this is non-commercial this is non-commercial, yeah. So these okay, are the guys. So is that a confirming factor or a contrarian factor? The non-commercial. Oh, this confirms to me what what, what direction oil is going to head into. So okay. I'm looking at supply and demand. I'm looking at what happens when price enters into a demand zone, and if I see them starting to close out short positions and start to add long positions, then that just reinforces that uh, they're accumulating a long position. And I'm going to start looking for long setups to 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 get in on one. Okay, so you give uh, both the non-commercial and the commercial equal weighting about how they're positioning themselves. Not uh, not uh, one is a contrarian indicator and one is a confirming indicator. Like yeah, I, when I, I don't I don't put them on the same uh, uh, scale because um, you never know what's going on with commercials. They could be hedging and they could be right. doing it for so many other purposes too. So I like to focus more on uh, what the non-commercial are doing because they are the speculators trying to make money in the direction that the markets uh, or that they think the markets are going to head into. Okay, well that's a completely different spin than most people are taught. Uh, most people are taught, oh, the dumb money is a non-commercial, the smart money is a commercial. And it's interesting because, you know, that I've seen the dumb money be right and the commercials be wrong. And you're right, we don't know what the purpose is of commercials' positions. They, it doesn't mean that they're bullish or bearish, they could be hedging. So right. uh, yeah, that's a pearl, Kevin. Thank you. Yeah. Well, over the four years, four plus years that I've been following the COT data, I've come to learn that uh, if you follow non-commercial and what they're doing, you're more likely going to be right than wrong. But you can't just look at the data and just buy, buy right. blindly or sell blindly. You need to understand technical analysis as well to time it. And your larger hedge funds would be in the non-commercial category. Yeah, the institutions, hedge funds, right. the bank. Okay. Yeah, those are all, all those right. guys. And the and the producers or end users are the commercials and corporations exchanging funds or hedging against you know uh, like Starbucks would buy 
would be selling coffee if they had mm -hmm. coffee, that sort of thing. Okay, beautiful. So uh, a great look and view and reasons and rationale. So we should be looking for the next pullback in crude to uh, start to uh, you know wade into the long side of crude. Should it give us a chance um, back under? Uh, and this is a Brent. This is not WTI, is it? No, this is Brent. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, and why the preference to Brent over WTI? Uh, no preference. I just okay. been always trading Brent. Yeah. Okay. You yeah. find it a more liquid contract, better fills, et cetera, or just worked out that you were no, just following worked out Brent? This, yeah, that just worked out this way that I started trading this one. Yeah. Okay. What else is on the radar for Magic Cat? So what's on the radar is um, Aussie. I'm bullish the Aussie right now. Um, if you okay. look at the COT data as well, you could see that 72% of all the positions in the Aussie right now are geared to the long side. Long positions are aggressive. Shorts are, are very cooled off based on uh, previous size. Um, so I'm long biased. We've got, uh, if you take a look at the monthly chart, right, we've got a nice ascending trend line here on the monthly. And uh, price is sitting right now inside of a weekly demand zone. So I'm waiting. And this weekly demand zone, see, this is exactly what I was telling you about how I use the COT data. I take a look at this weekly chart, and I take a look at this explosive move to the upside right over here. Right. And I look at the COT data. And I take a look at what exactly happened within that explosive move. And what I was able to figure out was this is the last time that the institutions added 14,000 long positions. It was right here. So okay. I know that last time the institutions were here, they added 14,000 long. So if the technicals are telling me that the force of price is to the upside, then once price gets down here, there's a pretty good chance that they want to fill in the rest of the demand that they didn't get a chance to fill in when they filled in this 14K. Because you could obviously see they fill in 14,000 long positions and it causes such a thrust to the upside that the only thing that causes it to reverse is a weekly opposing supply zone, which causes yeah. it to reverse. And now it's yeah. sitting back within this area. And so I'm waiting for it to start to accumulate, wait for the momentum to start shifting. And when momentum starts to shift, I'll start getting in long again. Okay, and your uh, line in the sand to negate this uh, scenario would be underneath the uh, demand zone and trend line, yeah. which comes in where? Yeah, exactly. Once it breaks 75, 71, I'm out. That means my okay. analysis is incorrect, and they probably want to test this monthly demand area a little bit deeper and then okay. wait to go up. Okay. Really but, great analysis. Uh, Oh, thanks. As, uh, uh, let me ask you this: uh, With you know, I kind of correlate what's happening in Aussie to what might be happening in gold. Uh, gold, yeah. Is there a, mm -hmm. is there a parallel between the two? And there is. You, do you kind of do you, do you kind of look at gold and Aussie as being, you know, if not brother and sister, at least cousins? Yeah, I do, and uh, yeah. that's that's good that you brought that up because if you take a look at gold. What do we see? We see institutions have 268,000 positions to the long side and only 75 to the short side. So their positions based on previous size in longs is very aggressive and their okay. positions in shorts is very cooled off, meaning you know they're not aggressive whatsoever with their shorts and the overall exposure is 78% of the total exposure to the to gold is geared to the long side. So that's telling me they want to go to uh, to push price north. And uh, right now, the only thing is that if you take a look at the monthly chart, all right, so we got this trend line here, right? Yeah. It's a three-month trend line. So that's pretty intense, three-month trend line. And it technically breaks right here with yeah. this area of demand, right? Mm -hmm. This area of demand mm -hmm. is the, the area that caused the break of that trend line. And so why is this important is because everybody and their grandmother who trades trend lines is, has this trend line drawn, right? They either have it drawn on a monthly chart or a three-month chart or a weekly chart, but this trend line is drawn. 
And institutions know that everybody's looking at that trend line. And institutions know that when price gets up to this trend line, everybody's going to start selling because that's what all the textbooks tell you to do. So the institutions right. know once price gets up here, everybody's going to be selling, which causes price to drop. And then when it gets back up here, everybody's selling again. So the only way that the institutions can break through all that selling is to fill in so much demand that it causes you know, all that supply to get absorbed and, and then causes a thrust to the upside. So that's what happened here. And this is an important area to me because that told me that not only does the COP report support the fact that the institutions are heavily long biased, but they broke a very important trend line with this specific area. The only thing is, is that we didn't get a really nice consolidation away from that area, but technically we did get a little bit of a consolidation. So price has reversed back to this area. That was uh, the spot that broke the trend line. And now what I'm waiting for is just some good confirmation to go long. So right now I don't see any really good confirmation yet. I'm waiting yeah. for some strong demand to come in on the daily chart. And when I see right. some strong demand come in, then I'm going to start to make my move. But looking at gold, I see all the signs that it, they want to take it up. And, and looking at Aussie, I see the same signs. Okay. Excellent presentation. So uh, the big question now in currency markets is the dollar or the euro, which are pretty much yeah. you know the same, same thing. So we could go either way. So it looks like you want to look at um, the dollar. Okay, so uh, the dollar peaked at 104. We have this big break uh, all the way to 90. We've had a nice recovery. A lot of people down at the 91 level or so were saying a bear market rally at least to 97. Um, but yet there are some Elliotticians and bulls that say that uh, there's a new high coming above that 104 area. Um, I'm starting to think that the dollar is starting to run out of juice up here. I'm looking for like 95 and a half to be taken out first. And then I'm going to be looking for short positions. And it looks like on your last chart, you kind of are looking for the same thing. Uh, what's the COT data and your technical work saying about uh, the state of the dollar? Is this more likely a bear market rally or was the low that we had back in September the beginning of a move to new highs. What, what's your best guess on that? So the US dollar is very tricky, very, very tricky right now. So if we take a look at um, the three month chart, what I could tell you is that we hit a three month supply zone. I think last time I was on with you guys, uh, we were reacting from this three month supply zone and, right. and price is dropping. That was a great call. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Uh, see three month supply right here. Here's the line goes right back here. So if we yeah. go to a three month chart, here's the area of supply. So price dropped, consolidated and dropped. And so we were, we brought it up in the discussion. Well, is there still supply there? Like what causes price to drop from an area that existed back in 2001? And like I said, I, I don't know if there's supply or not. Most likely not. I mean, this goes back too many years, but you know, there's no doubt that we could see price reacted to it, right? So, so price is reacting to the downside from a three month uh, supply zone. What typically happens with supply and demand, when price drops from an area of supply like this, it usually will drop until it hits a one time frame lower demand zone. So one time frame lower from three months is monthly. The only thing here is that this was not demand. The only demand zone here is down here on the charts at 87 and so we haven't even hit that yet so um, so it was free falling and now it just stopped in the middle of nowhere and started to reverse well here's the thing here's an interesting thing with the the US dollar uh, before you leave the like, chart bro what are the uh, green dotted lines underneath the recent low that we had oh those. right here yeah what are those oh that's uh, a representation of a weekly demand zone right here Okay, so there's weekly demand uh, around the 90 level, 89 level. Yeah, but that's okay. not going to stop anything. Um, okay. The only what, what's stopping price right now on a three-month chart, which I don't have uh, represented here, is the three-month uh, 20 EMA. 
Okay, there's a three okay. month 20 EMA right now that's hitting that. Uh, that's yeah. causing price to move to the upside. But yeah. let's take a look here. If you look at the uh, caught data, so here's the thing with the caught data. It's very tricky to read because, you know, back in April, we were extremely bullish. Uh, the US dollar with 93% of the overall exposure being to the long side. Right. Since then, it, they've really switched <laughs> from 93 to 80 to 68 to 52 to 45 and now to 49. Yeah. So even though the institutions, you know, 49% of their overall exposure is geared to the long side and 51% is geared to the short side. Pretty neutral. It's very neutral, but you know, after studying uh, the COT reports for some time and doing a lot of meditating and thinking about things, I came up with this coloration of these Excel, of my Excel spreadsheets, which uh -huh. take into consideration previous position sizes. Mm -hmm. And um, because if the institutions are heavily long biased, when we hit a supply zone and they start to become bearish, they can't switch from being heavily long biased to extremely bearish overnight it takes months to do that right so right. i i start to come up with a way of colorizing my cells based on previous figures to give me a more accurate representation of whether the institutions are starting to become bearish or starting to become bullish so based on all that stuff you know i take a look at the coloration of the cells here and i see that even though longs and shorts are pretty much even Longs are still considered to be very cooled off, considering where they used to be just very, uh, just very recently. And if yeah. you take a look at shorts, the colorations of the cells here are red, which tells me that they're still very aggressive short. All right, so okay. they're still very aggressive short. This pullback up right now is, you know, heading right into a downward uh, trending um, uh, 20 EMA. Okay. And so Where's we're pulling that back up. Yeah, so we're pulling back up to that like 50% retracement mark. Is that so about I 95 think, and a half that EMA? Yeah. Yeah, that's about okay. where it is. And All there's right. a wonderful, wonderful, beautiful weekly supply zone sitting right over here. And when weekly supplies get hit, price reacts to them. So between so, five and a half to six. Yeah, 95. At 9534 is where that weekly supply hits. Okay. So I'm expecting right. price to drop. The only thing is that when it gets down here, Dale, there's a weekly demand zone here. Right. So price is going to head back up. Okay. Interesting. You know what, Kevin? You know what? Uh, another great interview. But I have a theory that keeps on being proven mm -hmm. that the best traders are not necessarily the most famous traders. They just make money. Not always, but usually. And you're not and you're you fall into that category. And I don't know how or why we met or how I ever, you know, picked your name out off of Twitter, but thank you for approving my theory once again. <laughs> Thanks, Dale. I'm honored. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, so I, I mean, uh, every time you're on, I, I have areas that uh, give me um, uh, ammunition and intelligence gathering for me to consider in the days and weeks ahead. And for you just to step up at the last minute, um, because I couldn't reach a guest, is also um, commendable. And I really appreciate you being a, a great pinch hitter. You know, uh, you're, you're very talented technician and appreciate you edifying our community today my friend no problem dale anything for a friend okay bro so everyone thank my trading warrior brother kevin arajo and you could also follow him at magic kev magic kev is m-a-g not j m-a-g-i-k-e-v he's an excellent follow and you don't even have an ax to grind. You're not teaching, you're not selling signals, no. anything like that. No, just, just out just, to help people. You're just making a living off the market. You got it, sir. All right, buddy. Well, congratulations on doing that. A lot of people dream about being able to do that. So congrats, bro, and, and thank you for all the great looks in oil and gold.
and the dollar as well. Appreciate Thanks. it. Thank you for Thanks. giving us some Thanks. ammo. Thanks, man. Okay, everyone. Okay, buddy. I'll, I'll keep in touch. Yep, will do. And also, also everyone, uh, that's a wrap. Uh, special guest tomorrow, CNBC contributor Peter Bookbar will be with us. It's going to be interesting to see what Peter says about the dollar. He was a dollar bearer, so we'll see what he has to say tomorrow. I uh, want to thank Blake and Steve and Stelios and all the great questions that you guys gave us today. And uh, remember, don't just count your pips, count your blessings. See everyone for Turnaround Tuesday. Good hunting. The rest of you cannot find the Twitter feed. Again, it's Magic Kev, or it's M A G Ash I K E V at Magic Kev. See everyone tomorrow. Adios, my trading warrior brothers and sisters. See you in the other trading room. You're welcome, Humberto. Okay, Ash. Adios. Thanks, Kev.